Wednesday. It is Wednesday. The 15th of April. It doesn't matter if it's... I was going to say, I don't think it matters at all anymore. It is, you know, I think we could use that Groundhog Day joke every every day. Mm-hmm. I like it for documentation purposes. Yes, so I should make the Groundhog well, for the, for the every historical day, record when they look back a million years from now, you know, at what we did, you know, they will see this. That what we did on Wednesday. And yeah. the other thing is, I guess, because my ridiculously full calendar, I guess it's good to know what day it is sure. so I can make meetings and stuff. It helps. It sort of yeah. kind of maybe helps. I mean, if I Although, didn't have not, calendar, I would be nothing without Google Calendar. Yeah. Although all I really have to do to know when I'm supposed to be a meeting at a meeting is to ask either Eric or Mike, ah, and, and they'll ah, point ah, me in the right direction. I was going to say about probably fifty percent, at least fifty percent of your meetings are with me. Yeah, well, I, I said to say, have to be. No, I can't we'll even base it on what day I see Steve anymore because right. <laughs> no, and I it was funny. I was saying to Kathy today. I said. Uh, I said. I said, um, Eric and Mike are my quarantine BFFs. I was going to say. <laughs> Spending more time with you guys. Than, all right, but anyway, I think we're supposed yeah. to do a stream here. So Probably. we're we're here with with uh, Eric Leitner, and we're we're talking micro bits today. And micro bits are cool. I'm a big they fan. Are. Uh, I I in a previous life worked for an educational robotics company. You know, seven weeks ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not far removed from educational robotics, fairly familiar with the, the realm, but, um, this is Eric's stream and not mine. And I'm excited, uh, by all see. means chime in. I mean, like no. one of the things I've loved I'm gonna about play satisfactory while tips. you're talking. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Maybe no, we could figure so, out how to so, link a micro bit up to control the game or do commands. Ooh, ooh. You oh. could create a serial, uh, command in micro bit. That would be cool. It can't be done. Now I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Right. So tell tell let's let's get started. Talk about micro bits, what they are, and then let's get into it here. Sure. Uh, so here I'll hold one up to the camera here. There you go. That's a micro bit. Yeah. Um, so the micro bit, and I got a sticker on this one, so I know which one it is. But um, so the micro bit is a little microcontroller, little microcomputer, uh, developed actually by um, the micro bit uh, foundation with the BBC in the UK who put this in the hands uh, for free through a grant uh, in the hands of every eighth grader or middle school student, really, um, in the UK. Yep, they're everywhere. Uh, in this kind of initiative to get kids coding and thinking about physical computing. Uh, obviously, it was insanely successful. Uh, and what's great about it is they now offer these essentially at um, no markup to everyone. Because again, I was going to say, for, for whatever it's worth, they, they did a similar program in Canada, too, which made it very did. difficult to compete with. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, I, I, I'm i not going to pretend that I know the ins and outs of what's going on in the company and where. I can only <laughs> talk to what's happening are everywhere. In the US. They are everywhere. Uh, yes. And, you know, in the U.S., they're $15. That's what I know. <laughs> Nice. Uh, and that's, you know, and it's uh, been fantastic. So I've worked with a bunch of micro, you know, little programmable computers and microcontrollers and things like that. I'm sure you guys have too, whether it's Arduino or Raspberry Pi, the Pi Zero. Uh, the Light Blue Bean was one that I used to go to quite a bit, if you remember that one, which I don't think is too popular anymore, but I thought it was great for the time. Um, and of course, for any of our teachers or students who are doing middle school coding through code.org and CSD, you may have worked with the Circuit Playground or the Circuit Playground Express. Uh, all of those are very similar. But essentially, at its core, it's just a tiny little computer with a bunch of little inputs and output functions. Um, and it's really just honestly amazing how much tech they packed into this little thing for 15 bucks. And that's true of those other ones, too. They're, they're relatively low cost. Uh, but there have been re some reasons why we loved uh, this one uh, specifically here in Broward. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to argue that cost wasn't a factor. Cost is amazing. Um, but we've used the other ones, too. Um, but one of the big ones is uh, it overcomes a huge technology hurdle for us. Uh, and one of those huge technology hurdles, and you're, anytime you're dealing with a massive district, and actually I think this is something that even school-based or little smaller districts would have too, is getting software installed onto computers and making sure that all of those computers can actually effectively run that software. Um, we have over a million devices running in Broward. Um, guaranteeing that all of them, A, have the software, B, can run the software, uh, and of course are actually up and running at any given time is a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> uh, but the great thing about the Microbit is um, they partnered obviously with Microsoft and MakeCode, 
and uh, with the MakeCode platform, which I know you guys have shared a bunch because uh, you've shared, done some streams on MakeCode Arcade. Mm -hmm. uh, you've done using MakeCode as the platform for uh, Minecraft. Um, I love MakeCode. We'll talk about it, obviously, a little bit more. But um, it's absolutely free for the microbit. And the great thing is, when they first launched, they did launch a web-based coding platform and a downloadable desktop app coding platform, which was great because then if we didn't have internet access, some of those kids still had access to it. But the reality is they're actually pushing the web-based one way ahead of what the, the desktop app is doing. So we don't need to install anything. Uh, and that has been that That's has a been like difference. Oh, it's massive. Calling it's clients massive. is so, you know, I hate to call it like old school because some of the things you need clients for. Yeah. But the reality is, is that if you want in every school in North America, mm -hmm. you need to have a web client. Um because like just the reality is some districts are just not as open to installing, you know, and don't have the resources, the manpower even to manage, you know, a, a you know, a distribution um, right. a, of a software product or whatever. Exactly. Uh, and, and I'm not missing our IT have folks. A website. Our IT folks are amazing. Uh, yeah. The amount and quantity uh, that they have to manage, not to mention, you know, the, the the back and forth they're having with technical issues on a daily basis with the sheer number. I mean, we have 235 schools, you know, 250,000 plus students uh, and then an IT team downtown handling. I mean, yes, there's ITs at the school, but when it comes to the big issues, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot mm -hmm. to manage. Mm -hmm. So being able to just hit up a website and get going is a massive game changer. Uh, and has made our lives easy. And that's been true for other platforms. Like Scratch is great. You guys shared Scratch on Monday, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Scratch is phenomenal. And actually, I'll share something quick later uh, that we can do with Microbit and Scratch as well. Um, but with MakeCode, the fact that I can just go in, get started, and I'm not just coding. Like with Scratch, I'm coding in Scratch and running the program from Scratch. Here, I can actually get those programs onto device right from the website. Yeah, uh, which is awesome. It really, really is awesome. And that's actually one of the reasons I wanted to share it because the cool thing is for any of the students watching, teachers watching, whoever's watching that wants to work on these projects or learn how to code the microbit, you don't need one because you can actually just go to the website, which is what we're going to do. Uh, go to the website, pull open the programming uh, environment. There's a simulator for the device and you can code the simulator and know that your program is going to work before you even have a microbit in your hand. And that's something a, a right. virtual micro bit. This is yeah, something and it goes I, so it's much. funny actually. And a lot of a lot of yeah. ed tech robotic companies are copying this because uh, I can tell you that. Um, and I don't know if this is like super common knowledge, but I have insider information oh, yeah. uh, that is becoming public slowly. Is that Wonder Workshop has just developed a virtual dash, uh, so yes. that you can program in a web client as well. So that is public now. They they did do a YouTube yeah stream yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's and it's pretty phenomenal that they're doing that. I love that. Yeah, um, it's a, dash it's has been great for our younger group uh and honestly it, it builds up because i've seen kids who are even middle school do some really cool stuff building onto dash and things like that what they can totally yeah and and the um the virtual device is so uh you know helpful right now because in other words here we are doing a session on microbit and in the event that we wanted to bring this into our distance learning you know at least we don't need the kids to have the physical device so that's that's great oh yeah massive. you could totally teach educational robotics with microbit and not yeah. have to have a robot in your hand. It, it It's right. game changing, to be honest. And not to mention, they've, they're, they're constantly doing updates on the make code and microbit side. So right. actually, uh, and I'll share this later, uh, we probably won't spend too much time on it, but they've actually launched a classroom mode for make code and microbit where a teacher can have all the students join and see what they're coding live uh, from the website. And again, wow. just like before, free wow. software, all web-based, no login, just ready to rock. So you could, did you, say you could that, yeah. did you say you could demo live, like if we were doing a distance lesson, and I guess you'll do that shortly? Yeah, yeah. Or, that's, okay, cool. That's exactly what we will do. So uh, actually, right. if you want to share screen, I've got the MakeCode <clears throat> website open, which we've been to a few times this week. Yeah. So this is MakeCode.com, uh, and it redirects you to this Microsoft link. But if you just go to MakeCode, M-A-K-E-C-O-D-E.com, it'll take you right here. And again, here are all those things that you can program uh, using make code and I have lost my mouse cursor. There it is. <laughs> so for example, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, 
Wonder Workshop and the Dash, but the Q, which is another one of their robots, is codable uh, using the MakeCode platform. Uh, I know we have schools that have Lego Mindstorms. You did an awesome job demonstrating uh, MakeCode Arcade in an earlier session, which I know you guys have got recorded. Uh, the Circuit Playground Express, I love. We use it with our Code.org CSD uh, coursework uh, and has been great. Uh, so really, I've, I've worked with all of these in MakeCode, but I have a special place in my heart and funny that it's got a heart on it, right? That was not <laughs> a pun. You know what? It was a pun. We're going to go with it. I have a special place in my heart for it, and there's my heart right on it uh, for the micro bit. And uh, we're going to talk about why as we kind of jump into the uh, uh, into the coding platform. So if I click on the micro bit. So one, you'll see that I have a bunch of projects that I made down here. Um, it saves these projects uh, in your cache and your cookies or your web browser. So if you go and clear your browser stuff out, you will lose all of those. I do remind my students they can download their programs and re-upload them to the website anytime. So again, no software install required, but you can get your files off and back up onto the website. Um, for uh, management, it does really mean that if you want to keep going back to a program, you do want to keep using the same computer and the same web browser because that's where these things are getting stored. But just right off the bat when you jump in here, and we're not even looking at coding yet, we've got tutorials. Uh, there are live streams of coding and tutorials that have been done, uh, and they add new ones to these constantly. In fact, they're doing sessions of live uh, tutorials like crazy right now, uh, which is great. They're doing them on YouTube and everywhere else. Uh, here's some programmable games, and it teaches you how to do these. And again, you could do so many of these without even needing the hardware in hand right now, which is really, really cool. Um, and you see a ton of these down here. But then it gets into things that you can do physically, like making wearables, uh, connecting things, you know, why, you know, uh, doing the circuitry and connecting to other resources, doing science projects with them. Um, but one of my favorite things is if you go through these, um, and we've used this for a lot of things. So one of the things that people don't realize is that when you take something like the, uh, the CFAP tests, a lot of that information is not just on the coding, but is also on hardware. And down here, they've done a really good job of actually explaining every bit of hardware that is on board this thing and how it's used, how it works behind the scenes, how it was programmed, how it was developed. Um, so it's teaching not just the programming uh, and those basics, but it's getting into the deep uh, parts of the hardware, which is admittedly a lot of things that uh, are something that a lot of our robotics education programs don't do, right? Everything is kind of prepackaged. I love Wonder Workshop. I love Dash, but there's nothing that tells me about how all the parts that Dash has works. Uh, and admittedly, maybe so, because it is meant for like a K5 audience. Um, but this goes so far beyond that. So it's expandable. Uh, it, it grows with the user, which is great. And we'll look at other ways it does that too. Um, we're going to jump into a new project. So there are some really cool things about this. And I may not be able to share some of them as we do this live. But there are really cool things for teachers. Um, you may have a hard time seeing this also because some of the settings are behind the little follow us on Twitch fold you got on the screen there. And that's OK. No worries. Oh, it's gone. So there is this little <laughs> setting wheel here, up, uh, cog up here, and we're actually going to jump into that. But one of the things they've added recently is a way to do green screening. So if I do this, and I don't think I'll be able to use my, and, oh, I can. I can actually be behind the program and the simulator as I'm teaching it. So talk about a really cool tool for remote learning. So I'm going to keep that on. This is, this is, I love this, right? This is really cool. So I can actually point to things and say, OK, here's all of our folders. Um, and actually, Steve, you mentioned it the other day. Uh, MakeCode has a name, what they call their folders. What do they call them again? Drawers. Drawers. Yeah, I swear everyone's got a different name for these things, depending okay, so on what we, we ask. When, when you open it up, you see what's in your drawers, like your You stocks. sure do. Oh, see, I like the terminologies. I do. But literally every block coding platform has got a different terminology for these things, right? Uh, but it gives you a basic. We get it on start, and we got it forever. So I am wearing, uh, trying to hold this one up right now. There you go. I am actually wearing a micro bit that I have a little battery pack on and a magnet. So I turned it into a name badge. And one of the first things I like to code or teach people to code is literally just doing their name with a string. So we'll do that. So I've got an on start block and a forever block. But you'll notice on mine, and I'm actually going to take this thing off so you can see it, and I can hold it up to the camera a little bit better. Right On mine, here it is. 
right? It is just streaming my name over and over and over again. And I've done this. I make a point of this whenever I do PD with people for the first time on this. And many of those people, whether they're teachers or students in those classes, have never coded before in their lives. Um, that I can get them up in coding in seven minutes. And that includes editing in JavaScript, something they've probably never even seen before. And yes, every time I have been successful in that. So we're going to code a name tag. Here's our name tag. We're going to do that. And first of all, I ask them, you see my name is repeating over and over again. So do you think we're going to use that on start block or that forever block? 99% of them get that one right. Uh, we're going to use that forever block. So I'm actually just going to drag that on start into the trash. And again, notice the simulator every time I make a change refreshes and attempts to run the program. Of course, there's nothing to run right now. So it's nice and blank over here. But I'm going to go into the basic folder. And I'm going to grab a block that says show string. And by default, it says hello with an exclamation point. This is usually where I ask them, what is a string if we're typing hello? And again, most of them can get it. They'll say word or they'll say a sentence. Uh, you know, once we tell them that it's just a link of, you know, a grouped link of characters, whether that is symbols, uh, letters, numbers, and so on, uh, they get it really quickly. And again, that's one thing I love about the way this is set up is it really does help them grasp things like the vocabulary very, very quickly. So I've pulled in show string hello. And there is show string hello. And notice again, my simulator over here. See, this is why I love the camera behind. I can literally just point to it. I don't have to like wag my mouse around. Uh, is doing exactly what the code says, literally forever. It's looping just the word hello with an exclamation point over and over and over again. So again, we've already run an effective piece of code. It's two blocks up there and it's running on my simulated device. And if I had a microbit home, I could install it on that microbit. And I know for a fact it's gonna run because the simulator is showing me exactly what that program is gonna do. So let's do that. Let's get that onto this microbit. So I have this microbit connected via a USB cable to the computer. I can tell that it's powered up. It's got a little light on the back. There's the little light. And we're going to get this on there. So an easy way to do that, and they keep making the website better and better. This used to be something you had to do kind of manually by dragging the file you created onto the microbit. But if I go back up to that settings cog, I can pair a device, and we see that right here, pair device. So I'm going to pair device, right? So I'm going to click pair device. It's going to give me a list of devices that it finds. Here's my device right up here, and I'm going to hit connect. So now my device is connected. So if I come down here to that purple download button and click it, and hopefully this will work while I'm on camera, right? It's spinning and spinning and spinning. There you go. You see that it's blinking, which shows me that it's installing the program onto the microbit. And once that is done installing, which is going a little slow because I'm running a lot along with the live stream and so on, but that's OK. We're going to let it do its thing. Oh, you know what? It's also overrunning a Python uh, program that was on here, so it has to reformat it on the fly. But we'll leave that up there for a second. So it's as soon as that's done installing, you're going to see that hello that we've got going on on the screen right there actually run directly on this device. So we're going to let that run, uh, let it install itself. Usually it's much faster because once I have other make code programs on there, it doesn't have to do that reformatting, and it just kind of happens real fast. We'll let it run. Of course, you know when you're on camera is when exactly it wants to mess itself up. But while it's doing that, I want to share something else that can happen, right? So notice we've doing this in block command. And one of the things we love about this program is that it allows us to transition. Oh, something went wrong. OK, you know what? I've got a whole box full of micro bits. We're going to grab another one. Not a problem. It wouldn't be a live stream if everything went right. Let's try that again. It's funny. I did a, um, a session at FETC a few years ago, and I was um, so determined to demo the actual microbit there. And it would not send the file to the microbit. And I was like just totally perplexed and flustered. Later, I realized I was using my laptop, which did not have, um, which was running out of battery. And just the amount of power I think it needed uh, 
for the USB was just not doing it, and it was driving me absolutely nuts. Well, I'll tell you what. This might give us a way to show you how to do this manually if it would actually load my micro bit up. All right, let's close this and try it one more time. So let me pair this one because this one is not paired. And here's the new one. All right, now it says it's paired. It's successful, so let's try it again. I have a feeling a lot of this has to do with uh, how much I'm running uh, in browser windows right now. All right, so it is it is installing. That's what that little blinky light on the back tells us. And the good news is, is even if this doesn't work, which will still make me really sad because I had a lot of programs I wanted to install and show you today. Uh, even if this doesn't work, we can use the simulator uh, and we'll be fine. Something went wrong again. You know, I just can't win today. All right. So what I just did what. too, I don't know if it's different for yours, but mine, I did have right. to, um, I did have to send it to the, uh, right. to the external drive, to the microbit. Right. I'm going to try, right. That's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to actually save this directly onto the microbit drive. So one of the cool things about the microbit is when you do plug it in, it actually recognizes it as a, and I've got this download thing over my face. Uh, it actually recognizes it as an external drive. So I'm literally just going to save the file right to it. And it should do what we needed to do anyway. I wish I could get this download complete thing off the screen, though. It really does not want to go away. The good news is this is now working. Oh, see, now it's trying to run all those downloads at one time. Like, go away. Go away. There you go. And we've got hello on there. It worked. <laughs> so I guess I'll have to do things a little manually today. But manual isn't that hard. It's literally just taking that file and saving it directly to the microbit as a drive, which is just as easy as clicking that download button. So either way works. Um, apparently, we're having some issues because I'm running so much uh, through web browser and streaming. But because I was literally doing this right before we got on the call, making sure everything worked <laughs> and it was fine. Always. So, you know, Murphy's Law. But yeah, that hello is working. But I said we were making a name tag. So usually what I challenge people to do next is I say, you know what? At the top, it says that we're using block command right up here. Well, let's switch over to JavaScript. So literally at the click of a button, and of course, it's going to say like, oh, yeah, no, we'll do this for 20 minutes now, right? And then not switch. There it goes. So now we can see the commands in JavaScript up here. Right, So everything we were just doing in block has been translated to JavaScript. And we've seen other programs do this. Anytime you've worked in code.org, you can see the underlying code that you've created using the block uh, if you're in like the CFS, uh, CSF or any of those. But um, what's cool about this one is we can edit right in this. So it's still editable. And I can switch it back and forth from block to JavaScript at any time. So I said we were making a name tag. So in JavaScript, all I, I can see now, oh, that's how the JavaScript would be written. It's really easy to know where to edit, change this to a name tag. And again, once I click out of there, it'll run that. But what's also really cool about this is I switched from block to JavaScript, but I've still got the drawers. We're going to use the right term here for them. They'll be, they'll be happy. Mm -hmm. All right. I still got my drawers, but when I click into those drawers now, I don't see the same linkable uh, UI blocks that I had before. Instead, what I see is the actual syntax for JavaScript in blocks. So I can drag lines of syntax in and use this, which makes it a really amazing transition tool for students who are transitioning mm -hmm. from block uh, to the actual yeah. text syntax coding. It really is fantastic. I'm so so happy with the way um, Make Code has not only you know done that to teach the transition, but also because it works on so many platforms, um, it's just amazing. And and the fact that they're adding you know Python to some of them, like Minecraft, is just like incredible. So right, I'm a fan. I love that. I love that. So what I figured we would do next, I'm going to get out of this program. 
Uh, I'm not gonna. I mean, you can save any of your programs. So if I wanted to call, give this a name, I could call it new. Uh, this was name tag, even though I think I have one called name tag already because that's a project I do like an infinite amount of times. But I want to share some other things um, that we can do. Before that, though, I want to talk about. So I actually, for a presentation that I did, uh, created a sway. So for those of you who are not familiar with. Uh, Microsoft Sway, it's basically like a presentation tool that lets you generate a website that's kind of like a PowerPoint-based presentation. But I use it to kind of share the information I'm presenting on so that uh, anyone who comes to a presentation has access to it. But I wanted to share a graphic that's in there, uh, and that's this one, just so people realize how much is on board this thing that they can program, right? Because it's not just, oh, it's got little lights and little buttons on it, which the lights I love, don't get me wrong. Uh, but there's a ton of stuff on this thing, right? So sensor-wise, we've got light sensors. Uh, there's a magnetic sensor on here, so you can do compasses. There's an accelerometer. Uh, there's a blue. This has Bluetooth built in, which is something that most of the other ones don't, which has been really phenomenal. Which means you can send signals from one to the other. So I actually use this to teach students how text messaging actually works underneath the hood, um, and they can send messages from one microbit to another microbit, which you know it sometimes gets a little sketchy, but. <laughs> But it's a lot of fun to do. Um, I'm guessing so you can make a tic-tac-toe game where we play on different micro bits or something. You can. Cool. Uh, we've done rock, paper, scissors. We've made virtual dice where they can shake it and roll the die. Um, there's a ton of those. Uh, so they can do so much in this. But what I love, one of the things I love about this, and I'm going to start up a new uh, program in there. Let's jump into a new project is one of the things that you may have noticed isn't on board, because I don't want to spend all day talking about what's on board this thing. Uh, you'll find out by coding it, to tell you the truth, or go into the website and explore some of the hardware in those videos that I showed earlier. But one of the things that's really cool about this thing, uh, and admittedly, it's because there's some things that aren't on board, is that it has these pin connectors at the bottom. And while some of the other ones have pin connectors, I know that the uh, Circuit Playground has them around the perimeter. I love the way that these are laid out kind of like an old NES cartridge which, I mean, they're actually exactly like an NES cartridge, uh, because it means that we can use adapters to connect this to so many other things, but we don't even necessarily need those extra components or adapters because the platform and the simulator actually show you how to do it. So, for example, one of the things you may have noticed is not on board this thing is audio, right? There's no external speaker or buzzer built into this one, right? The Circuit Playground has a little mini buzzer speaker built in. This one doesn't. But you'll notice there is a drawer for music. So how do we make music if it has no audio output? So this I love, right? So we're going to jump in here. And you'll notice there's all these. I can play notes like middle C. Uh, I can you know, do a melody. Uh, I can do things that queue up by melody. I can change the tempo, the pitch, um, the beats, and so on. I can do all of that. I'm going to grab this one that says start melody because there are some kind of just built in tunes and that's a good way to kind of start learning how to do this. And I'm going to throw in this start melody da da dum. <laughs> and right now it's just repeating once, but I could have it loop forever and I'll show you how to do that in a second and I don't even need the forever block to do it. But look what happened to our and I'll actually pause this for a second. So one in the simulator we are hearing the code. We're hearing the music in the simulator, but also look at what happened to the graphic here. It's showing us how to connect audio to the micro bit, right? So it's telling us to basically take a wire and connect it to this pin on the headset or uh, audio cable and take one from the ground over here and do the same to this other section of the audio adapter. Um, and we can output directly from the micro bit to a speaker or a pair of headphones or anything else. We can connect up audio devices. So uh, my favorite that's on here that's pre-built in, and I'm not going to lie, and it's kind of my nerdiness, and I also know that it loves to uh, annoy students, is let's see who recognizes this one. We'll go forever on this one because this one needs to go forever. So let's run that one. Uh, spinny, spinny, spinny. <laughs> You guys know what that's from, right? I don't know if there's anyone in the chat guessing, but you guys got to know this one. 
I bet you Kathy knows it. I bet you Kathy knows it. I don't know what that. Anyone is. know what that one's from? You'll know the next one. Don't worry. <laughs> now, what do you, you have it there? Start melody. Rainbow yeah. So cat? what I've done. What's it? What's Rainbow Cat? That is. That's from Nyan Cat. It's that little, right. It's oh, the Rainbow Nyan Cat that looks like a pop tart that goes forever that drives you insane. But, so I'm There's sorry. Like 10 hour one... videos of it on YouTube. But now the melody you programmed separately as like a function? Right. So this one is actually built in as a function. But you oh, can okay, program your own melodies. But what I want to do real quick is I'm actually, um, I'm going to click save on this one. Uh, not here. Let's see if I can get this one onto the device without syncing. Let's see if this one gives me a hard time. Because I want to show you how we can connect this up to a speaker. Oh, Kathy said, can I play? Oh, she's got the video now. Never mind. <laughs> she found it. <laughs> yeah, downloading is, is happening real slow, unfortunately, today. And I wonder if uh, MakeCode is getting bombarded. And in a weird way, I hope that's the truth. I hope a lot of people are, <laughs> are tackling this one uh, right now. All right, well, I'm going to let that keep running. I'm curious for the chat, anybody playing along at home and, and, and exploring the MakeCode site and Microbit as well? Because so it, it's so easy to just jump right into the web page and get really, started. It really, really is. And Ms. Lee Teacher is here. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. All right, so downloading apparently is just not a thing that's going to happen today, which is really depressing. I had so many fun things I wanted to show, but the good news is that means we get to focus on the simulator. So I'll tell you what, we're going to do another thing in the simulator, right? And by the way, I do have, I was going to show you, I do have some alligator clips and I do have some wires. And this is a really great place to start teaching circuitry where we can talk about the fact that these two top sections or tips of the pin of the 16, uh, uh, 1 16th adapt, audio adapter uh, are our stereo channels. And then the base is our ground wire. So if I hook this to the top one, I'm essentially connecting to a mono audio channel and by doing this one i'm completing the circuit uh with the ground wire and then of course connecting those to the micro bit um would output the audio and again it's showing me exactly where to clip those on my micro bit right there on the simulator so that's totally doable and i love that so let's do some more stuff with the simulator so I'm going to go back home. I know I'm not going to, I'm going to skip name in this one because I don't think this is anything I need to save for now. Real quick though, I'm going to jump into a pre-existing one that I made because I want to show you some of how deep you can get into doing things like coding audio. So you know me, big Star Wars nerd. So I was like, okay, uh, mm -hmm. I want to code some stuff around Star Wars. What can I do? So I actually had, and I'm going to let this kind of load up in the background here, but in the meantime, I'm going to jump into this GIF right here. And yes, I'm saying that with a hard G. We're not arguing about that today. <laughs> but you'll notice. Uh, <laughs> I say GIF also. Right. Okay, good. Good. Yes. It's not a giraffical image format. Anyway, uh, you'll notice these two little light panels uh, <laughs> right here on R2's head that have kind of this randomly blinking array of lights, right? So not the big eyeball light over here or that, you know but the two little panels right here and here. And I said, you know what? I bet we could easily program that using the LED array that's on a micro bit. And if we wanted to build like a cardboard R2-D2, we could totally do that using those two or using micro bits to represent those two panels. Now they wouldn't be blue because micro bits LEDs are just, you know, monocolor red, uh, but we could get the same effect. And then we could always apply a filter or something to try to change the color of them. Mm -hmm. So I did that very simply by toggling the X, Y coordinates on the micro bit just so that they blink randomly. So we've got the, from the LED drawer, we pulled in this toggle command. And I, from the math, I just had it pick one through four or zero through four because that's how these are LEDs are represented from left to right. That's the zero, zero. And down here is the four, four on the X, Y. It starts at the top left and works down. Uh, and what's cool is if the simulator should. Funny, we're, we're seeing it. We're seeing it, it mirrored. We um, oh, we're mirrored. So I've got to. Yeah, so I'll just. Right, I got to go this right, way. Exactly. But, right. yeah, upper, but what's cool upper is upper left the simulator zero, is there, zero. if you hover over those LEDs, it actually tells you which coordinate is which. So you don't even have to guess. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. going to try and play this, even though that simulator is spinning and spinning today. 
And of course, it's not going to be my friend. Please be my mm -hmm. friend. Mike and Steve can vouch for me. They heard this playing before we started the program today. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> okay. I could hum it. No, I don't really want to. Do you want, you want to hum it? Do you know what I even programmed yeah. here? I, I, I mean, I know it, you it, did. I believe, I believe it, it looks, you know, looking at the code you have there, it looks a lot like the Star Wars theme to me. It is the Star Wars main theme. It is. And it loops. But uh, you can see this took a little while to code. Just, just a little while. <laughs> and maybe funny, that's why our stream is taking so long to kind of catch up. I'll tell you what, the other maybe, day. If I kill, maybe if I kill the green screen effect, things will run a little faster. So let's uh, turn that off and see what happens. Remember, too, you should be able to just, what if you just drag it over to the, uh, to the micro bit as an external like drive? I could do that. Let's give that a shot and actually see if we can drag that right onto the micro bit and just run it on the micro bit. So let's give that. <laughs> was, was that really the inspiration? I wear the crowns, or Eric? Were you were you inspired? What was the inspiration? By I was. I okay, I'm my... not even kidding. One hundred percent. That was the reason. Cool. And you you was that because of the one of one of my students? I think did that right. Yes, and that was one of the things that, that Kathy had to share with me, and I was like, "This is amazing." Uh, I like sent it to like three other people. It's All funny because right, so with I am dumping I that gonna... on there, so we should be working. Let's I was just going to say can. real quick, though, one of the neat things about like make code in this is you give kids a little challenge. Like I said, oh, you know, you know, um, it, my kids modify their code. So they'll follow a tutorial, then they'll modify it. So one of the things we'll talk about is maybe adding music. And this kid added that whole um, song, Careless Whisper. And it was like, whoa. So, so good news, cool. Steve. We Yay. have success. Even though our simulator is not necessarily running because I'm running way too much stuff going on here, apparently, for this browser to keep up. Uh, but... I did. I was able to take that code and put it right onto the micro bit. So first, you see, I have like randomly blinking LEDs, kind of like R2's head there. Uh, I am going to hook up these two alligator clip wires. So here we go. The red is my ground wire. The yellow is my uh, zero pin on my micro bit. So we're going to take that ground and hook it to the ground section of our audio adapter here, audio connector. And we'll take this and do it to the tip, which is our first uh, mono connection. And we're going to reset this. And hopefully you can hear from this little speaker that I have uh, through the headset, because I'm going to hold it up to the headset. So it's not on right now, but I'm going to turn it on. Can we hear that? Totally. All right. So that is, again, I'll reset it. That is playing from the micro bit through those alligator clip wires out to this little speaker right here. Uh, which I am yelling over right now. I'm sure and Christy is really happy downstairs in her office. Uh, <laughs> but it's working. So that that is how we can connect up audio devices. So we're going to jump into a new program. But audio uh, works great, and it shows you in the simulator how to connect up that audio device, which is really, really cool. So let's start a new project. And uh, let's hope that our simulator can keep up with us. Again. All of this while I was not streaming video through my web browser was working beautifully. Uh, so I'm sure it'll work beautifully for you at home. It is not being my friend today, but there's our simulator, so we're good. So we do have some other sensors on board, and one of those sensors is a light sensor, right? So there is actually a light sensor built into this. It is located at one of these little pins up at the top over here kind of in this area, if we're looking at this simulator over here, where I'm wagging my mouse around. Uh, so what I want to do, though, is I want to get data from that light sensor. And I want to uh, have an output of that data from the light sensor on there to graph or collect data from a computer. And that is much easier than it sounds. So I'm actually going to go into the LED section over here, because there's a block in here that lets you use the LED array to graph data. And it's really easy. And it's this one down here that says plot bar graph of. All right, so I am going to grab that. And I'm going to put it inside the forever block. I will not need this on start for now, but we'll just set it aside. Now, right now, we're not telling it what to graph at all. But we want it to graph the data from the light sensor. The light sensor is one of our device inputs. Oh, I just saw May the Force be with you. You, you know what's funny is it's we just passed Easter and stuff, and I'm 
Jewish, but I still want to say, and also with you. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go into input. And you'll notice right here is one that says light level. Now we also have temperature because it has a thermometer built in. We have compass heading because it has that magnetic sensor built in. We have acceleration because it has an accelerometer built in. But for now, I'm going to grab that one that says light level. And that's what we want to graph. We want to forever plot a bar graph of the light level that that sensor is connecting. And you'll notice over here, I get a sensor or a little uh, light adapter, right? That goes from zero or uh, simulator, I'm sorry, where we can simulate the amount of light because again, this is not the device, this is just the simulator. So if it's receiving a little light, it'll look like that. And if it's receiving a lot, it'll look like that. And notice this goes up to two, from zero to 255. So we're actually gonna change this because we want the maximum range to graph up to 255. Now, if my microbit, I, mean, I know we've had some issues with this, uh, was paired, and I don't necessarily need to do this because again, I can use the simulator to learn how to do it right now. If my microbit was running this program and was paired with the browser window, the way I showed to pair earlier, I could get live data streaming from this uh, directly and graphed onto my screen, which could then be exported as a uh, Excel file. And then I can graph it in Excel and use that for data or science fair projects or whatever it is we're doing with that data. Uh, so for example, I can simulate this. So you'll notice this new button over here showed up when I did that, that said show console simulator. So if I click that, you'll notice we get this kind of live graphing bar showing up here. And it's live graphing from our simulator over here. So if I raise the light level, whoop, we're getting a live graph of that. And if I lower it, it goes down and so on. So we can change the light level or we can record live the light level that the device is seeing, again, directly in the website. I'm doing this through the simulator right now, but this also works with the device. So if we had the device, and we had that program running, I could literally take my hand and wave it over that, raising it up and down, or take a light source like this lamp over here and point it at it, and we would see that graph going up and down. Really, really cool. So I love that we can do that so simply, but there's more we can add to this, right? That is great, this makes a great sensor. Uh, we have a, a teacher in our department, uh, one of our coworkers, our uh, instructional facilitator, Sarah, uh, Cheryl Ariola, who's probably watching, although I don't know that she's logged into Twitch, but she is, um, she does a lot of environmental science and she has actually created a program where students are using the microbit for environmental science. So they're doing soil moisture testing using the microbit. They're doing light sensing using the microbit for their garden projects. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. And some of the ways, uh, remember it has Bluetooth so they can get some of that data remotely. They could set this up in the garden outside the classroom, have more microbits receiving that data inside the classroom, have that data go from the microbit to the computer and see a live graph, live feed of what those microbits in the garden are actually recording. So really, really cool stuff. Uh, I'm gonna go back because let's say the students wanted to add some physical components to this, right? So one of the things that students can do to add a physical component is what if we had a live dial, right? Like a, like a live arm, almost like an odometer that was giving us a physical, visible measurement of the amount of light. So for example, an arm that would go from zero, let's say to 180 degrees, depending on the light level, kind of like a meter, physical meter that you have you know, on your dashboard of your car or the electrical meter on the side of your house. Uh, to do that, we can add things like a servo, right? A servo would do that 180 degree motors kind of motion really easily. So if we go into the advanced section down here, I don't see anything that shows me servos. But one of the cool things is there are extensions and other things we can add to our coding platform that Microbit can interact with. And you can see some of the additional accessories that you can buy that work with it. But you'll also notice there's a section for servo right here. So I'm gonna add servos to this project. And hopefully it'll happen quickly. Because what we wanna try to do is we wanna see if we can learn how to connect a servo to this so that as that light level goes up, that servo actively moves uh, in kind of coordination with that data. So we have a physical, visible, uh, hardware-based uh, 
basically robotics that are showing us the active light level that the microbit is recording, right? So for that, you'll notice that now that I've added that, I have a drawer called servos. So I'm going to jump in there, and I am going to grab this set servo angle to 90, let's say, right? I notice right now it's connecting that to pin zero. And again, nothing is happening in our simulator because I didn't put it anywhere. But to make this easy so that things aren't going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, I want both of these things to happen side by side. I want it to forever plot the graph of my light level and record that data. And I want it to forever move the servo in coordination with that. I don't want that to happen back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I want them to happen simultaneously. So I'm gonna grab another forever block. And I'm going to grab this set servo and put it in there for now. And again, just like when we hooked up audio, our simulator is going to change. And look what it's got now. It's showing me how to connect a servo to the micro bit, which is so cool. Uh, again, most of the students who I've had can do this or have worked with can do this without literally needing any assistance. They just go, oh, that's where those three wired or those three pins go. Got it. I can make this work. Keep in mind that the power output from a microbit is three volts, so you need to get the right servo. You don't want to get a six volt uh, servo. Not going to work unless you have an additional power supply, which again, there are ways to do that through breadboarding and stuff, but um, and through adapters uh, that exist for the microbit. But if you want to just make it happen right out of the box, three volt servos, and I've tried a few, almost all of them work just fine. So, so we've connected a servo, but right now that servo is just set to 90 degrees. Now, before I do anything else with this, I want to play with those servo commands a little bit. So what if I wanted the servo to go back and forth from 0 to 180 and just kind of do a whole range? What if I just wanted it to do this for now, right? Don't worry about the light level. I just want it to do this. Easy. What's cool is, one, if our students aren't that comfortable or familiar with degrees and angles, there is a built-in slider that shows them the ranges and where that would be positionally using this red bar. So I could set this one to zero, and I could set this one to 180. But watch what our servo does. Let's let it run. Oh boy, that doesn't look right. And it's doing that because um, that servo motor needs time to get from one angle to the other. So we can put in some um, pauses to give it a chance to get there. And I'll duplicate that and put one after, and we'll let that loop. And again, this is just 100 milliseconds. That's one tenth of a second. Still probably not enough time to do the full range, but you notice we're getting there. But if I change that to, let's say, one second and let that run, now my servo is doing a full range of motion. And that's awesome but that's not what we wanted it to do. But at least we're learning how the thing works as we connect it to our microbit in the simulator. What we wanted it to do was to always set itself to the light level. So I'm gonna drag this out of here. I'm keeping an eye on the time for us guys too. Uh, and I'm gonna duplicate that light level variable. And I'm gonna put it in here so that it always sets the servo to match the light level. And now, as I slide this up and down, the servo is always matching the value of the light level. And there you go. So you could take that servo and out of cardboard, put on an arrow and set it up with like a you know, graph of all of the measurements of light level. You know, you could translate those, those 255 uh, <laughs> bits, if you will, uh, into lumens. You know, you'd have to do a little bit of math and some measurement. Uh, but you could create a physical moving uh, component that demonstrates the light level, which is really, really cool. Let's kick it up a notch. What if we wanted an audio to play? Kind of almost like a Geiger meter or anything else, right? You're watching. Ghostbusters, and they've got their meters, and their meters, you know, as they get closer to something, are beeping faster and faster or ticking faster and faster. So maybe we want an audio way because uh, we want to make sure that everyone, this is accessible for everyone. So maybe if somebody is visually impaired, they need to hear 
the light level, which would be really cool for some of our visually impaired students to be able to actually understand the amount of light in the room when they can't see it because they'll have an audio cue for it. Well, we can do that too. And we're gonna do that the same way we did uh, the other one. We're gonna grab that forever block again. And actually, no, well, yeah, we can keep that for now. And we're gonna grab a uh, music cue going in the wrong folder. And we're gonna play a music note. Let's play middle C for one beat. And this is gonna be annoying, guys, I'm sorry. All right, I'm gonna pause that so we don't hear that like crazy for a minute, but notice we're getting a steady beat. But right now, no matter what I change, that beat isn't gonna change. But before we do that, look at our simulator. We now have two devices to hook up. So what did it do? Okay, we don't have enough pins for you to do that manually. So we're gonna show you how to breadboard that. And it's showing us all of the pins that we can breadboard uh, to get both audio and our servo working together. And again, breadboarding is sometimes a hard thing for our students to learn. This has made it so easy because they just look at that diagram, they know where their wires go, they can make this work with little to no assistance. And again, I know for a fact that if I set everything up, put my program on my micro bit, get my breadboard hooked up the way I see it here, that everything is gonna work exactly as intended because the simulator is showing me that it will work. If it was wrong, it wouldn't run or we would see nothing there. So again, it's really fantastic for doing that. But what I can do is take this tempo block and again, instead of setting the tempo here, we're gonna set the tempo to match the light level. And we're gonna run that. And if the light level goes up, It's lagging a little bit, but the beeping gets faster. And if the light level goes down, the beeping gets slower. And we're going to pause that so we don't murder everyone's ears with beeping. Right? So this is a really, really easy, easy, easy way to create um, physical computing uh, and robotics, as, as Michael mentioned. But it's not even just robotics, right? Because it's teaching us the underlying circuitry and things as well. Uh, and again, I don't even need to own that. I don't have a breadboard home. I did not bring one from work. I didn't bring all these wires and components. I have no servos at my desk, but I can write these programs and know that they're going to work as soon as I get this hardware. So that is a really, really uh, cool thing that I absolutely love about this simulator. Love it. So we're almost out of time, guys. We're like seven minutes left. So I thought I'd share one more thing. And this is one that necessarily you can't do at home. I have some good news. Um, if I go into, um, actually, real quick before we do, I do want to also share, uh, you shared Scratch earlier, uh, and I'm not going to necessarily demonstrate this one real quick, but you can actually also use the microbit in Scratch. It does work a little differently. It connects via Bluetooth. It does require an install of something called Scratch Link to connect your computer to the microbit. But then when you create your games, you can use it to as a controller. Uh, so it can be actively as a wireless controller for your game. So I'm not going to so demonstrate that. Uh yeah, yeah, go Steve. But Eric, with, with that, do you um do you also have to add the extension to Scratch or do with with um right. with Scratch three, does it automatically have those? I forget how so that part beauty works. Beauty in Scratch three, and I'll tell you what, you're you're talking me into it. So maybe we'll share this really ah. real quick. You're talking me into it. So I actually have a micro bit with the Scratch uh, hex code running on it because this does not install on the micro bit the way the make code one does. It installs um onto, um, it installs a hex file here that just basically gives it a Bluetooth name and signal. The program runs from scratch, but down here on the bottom left is where those extensions are, and it's actually built in. So, so when I you say it runs from scratch, do you mean that the, in other words, you have the hex code and the Bluetooth, so it's connecting right. to it, but you're no longer downloading it from right. the computer to run it's, it. It's actually it's automatically on going. The computer, right, not on the device. That's awesome. Okay. Right. So if I click on that and I have everything set up, it'll recognize that. And it tells me that because look, it gave me a name on mine, which mine is Gazap. <laughs> so if there's a bunch of students in the room, you actually know whose is whose so they can connect to their own. 
So I'll connect to this mm -hmm. one. And again, notice I'm just using a battery pack for this one. I am not wired to the computer at all right now. Now because there are some another and some weaknesses to this one. I can't do any of that simulator stuff that I just showed you in MakeCode, but I can use it as a sort of wireless means to add inputs or controls to my Scratch programs. And of course, this is going to go really slowly. <laughs> there it goes. It connected. Good news. So, so what I was going to ask too is, is the um, yeah, yeah. with the you can only have one hex code or one program on the micro bit at a time. Is that correct? That in other words, correct. like you can't. Yes. Okay, so that's why it has to work that way because, right. in other words, it needs just to interact with Scratch using the code that can be downloaded to it, rather than can each time downloading. Okay, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So this is actually a game that my students made in a summer camp like three years ago that we kind of collaborated on, and then they made their own games because I told them to just spitball ideas at me, and it's called uh, Pizza Cat in Space. <laughs> Uh, and then once we started with the micro bits the next year in the summer camp, I said, let's see if we can add the controls using the micro bit instead of just the arrow keys on our keyboards, which is what we did originally. So instead of doing that, and again, I'm going to use this wirelessly, and I'm going to run this program. And notice I got my little heart on here telling me I've got lives, and they actually want it to work in as an Easter egg that they can dance in the menu with the micro bit. But I can actually click start here, and I can play this game by tilting the micro bit and using the buttons, which is going really slowly right now. So the goal of this game, by the way, uh, is to avoid the cucumbers, because cats are scared of cucumbers. If you've ever watched the internet, anything, you know that. And get the pizzas. And luckily we have like music, by the way. And again, I'm doing this just by tilting the micro bit. I'm just going to let them die, though. I'm going to let them die. But you get the idea, right? So that was a fun one. Uh, there you go. That's awesome. So that was a game we came up with. We kind of programmed together, and then they broke out and did their own games. Uh, but again, we were able to adapt it really easily to use the micro bit as the input, which is really, really cool. A lot of fun. Um, I don't well, know how much time we have left. We had three minutes. I was going to share one more thing, but I don't know that we thing. have the time. Do it. Do, do it. it. Do it. Do it. Do one it. One more thing. Yeah, this has been good. <laughs> OK. So. This is the online, and again, web-based. I love web-based. This is the online editor that we can actually code directly in Python. Uh, so there is a Python editor, again, from Microbit, right online. Uh, don't need anything else to do this. Uh, I absolutely love that, right? So I thought I'd write a little program real quick for Steve, because one of the things with Python is there is a library of functions that can be imported um, that go well beyond some of the stuff that you can do in, in MakeCode. Uh, like way, way beyond it. So I'm actually going to wipe out this program and we're going to write one really fast. So from the microbit library, we're going to import two commands. And that's all we need for this one. Uh, the first one is sleep, just so we our program knows when to pause. Uh, and we're also going to import something called speech. And I think you have an idea where this is going. So we are going to very quickly, and that's ex it's probably exactly what we think about. This is a text-to-speech editor, and it's actually based on a program that came out in 1982 for the Commodore 64 uh, called SAM, which was one of the very first text-to-speech uh, program programs. Um, I'm going to see if we can do this twice. Shout. Really. Shout. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, no, first we got to do this. So we're going to greeting Mr. Isaac. Uh, he tweeted something out uh, earlier this week. Now, I have been playing with this, and I'm actually going to change something. If you've ever worked with old school text uh, to speech editors uh, or, or uh, programs, you know that it doesn't pronounce things it doesn't understand well at all. So I actually tried this earlier, and you're going to love this. We wanted to say your name right. Ha, <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, we're going to sleep for uh, one second. So 1,000 milliseconds. And then this is where you had to correct me today, right? I feel like I, I lost some 80s cred, and my cat wants <laughs> to walk onto the screen right now. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> Bonus points in the chat if you know what this is from. Who are we giving bonus can, points to? Can I get the bonus points? 
Oh yeah, you can give the bonus points. No, I don't deserve. I, 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 I definitely know. Literally, what we're telling it to do is to literally, in, you know, use the sleep, uh, sleep function and the speech function to do this. And again, just like before, we can connect the micro bit, and hopefully this will work. It does say that it's connected. We can flash the micro bit. Let's see how long this is going to take. We at least get a progress bar on the screen. And in the meantime, I'm going to hook up our audio just like we had before. Which I've made a mess of wires on the desk. So I'm glad we have just a few seconds for this so I can make these adjustments to the chaos of wires that is currently on my desk. Okay. I'm going to take that little mini speaker and turn it on. I am going to connect uh, my ground wire, which I've got right here, uh, and my zero pin. Again, hooking up audio the same way we did in our make code editor. I've got my speaker on, and that's connected. So as soon as that is done flashing, this program should run. So I'm going to hold this speaker up to the microphone here, so hopefully people can hear it. Look how close it is. So close. <laughs> <laughs> we lost oh, we play, okay? There it was. There it <laughs> is. Yeah, one more time. One more time. Oh. There we go. So there's. How about um yeah. global thermonuclear war? Are you gonna make me time this in, or you know? <laughs> or should we I write? Uh, we gotta head out, friends. I think we do. I think we do. Exciting as all of this is. Um. So thanks. Uh, Eric, for for sharing that with us, that was really yeah. quite a, quite a quite a cool little thing. I I love the micro bits, and and I know a lot of other people do as well. Um, so maybe we'll we'll uh, we'll have you back and do another micro bit session some other time. Uh, because one where everything is working better, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it worked okay. It worked okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, be sure and to come uh, back uh, later this afternoon. We're playing a game called The Pack. Uh, it's been created by uh, uh, Nysai in New York. Um, that uh, that I, I played a little bit with it this morning, and it's uh, it's interesting. I'm excited to learn about why I was doing what I was doing, uh, which was which should be good. So someone can explain that to us. And um, what else is going on? The Gone Home Game Study tomorrow afternoon. So if you uh, if you're interested in playing Gone Home with us. Uh, and talking about it, we'll be joined by Paul Darvazi and uh, John Spike on the stream. And one of the developers of Gone Home is joining right. us for the stream tomorrow, uh, which is super exciting. So I get to, you know, play her game in front of her, which is always great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, be sure to follow us uh, on twitch.tv slash inside participate. Uh, so you get notifications when uh, when we go live. Uh, thanks, Eric. Thanks, Steve. We'll see Thanks, you soon, everybody. Yeah, Have a absolutely. great day. Stay healthy. You too. Yes.